وعلى آل سيدنا ومولانا محمد وبارك وسلم وسلم عليه الصلاة والسلام عليك يا رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه يا سيد يا حبيب الله الصلاة والسلام عليك يا رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه يا سيد يا حبيب الله after praising Allah subhanahu wa taala and sending peace and blessings and infinite salutations upon the best of creation the beloved of Allah Almighty the light that that was sent to enlighten the world in particular to enlighten the heart of the believers. With the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we are gathered here once again to commemorate a program and send salutations upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The program will start with the Talawat followed by the Nasheed, followed by a break from Maghrib and the speech by Sheikh who struck from Saddam to introduce us today. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim Bismillahi ar-Rahman ar-Rahim La uqsimu bihada al-balad Wa anta hillun bihada al-balad خلقنا الإنسان في كبد لا أقسم بهذا البلد وأنت حل بهذا البلد لقد خلقنا يقول أهلكت مالا لبدا أيحسب أن لم يره أحد ألم نجعل له ولسانا وشفتين وهديناه النجدين فلا أقسم فلا فلا افتحم العقبة وما صدق الله العظيم وبلغنا رسوله النبي الكريم نبى ذي سبب رسائل المشيت بس Oh, 
जो तुझको जो तेरे नबी को पसंद है जो तुझको जो तेरे नबी को पसंद है मुझे ऐसा बंदा बना मेरे मौला मुझे ऐसा बंदा बना मेरे मौला मुझे ने इंसान बना मेरे मौला तुझे तो खबर है मैं कितना बुरा हूँ तुझे तो खबर है मैं कितना बुरा हूँ तू एबो को मेरे छुपा मेरे मौला तू एबो इंसान बना मेरे मौला मेरी ताक आमत जो नस्ले हो यार मेरी ताक आमत जो नस्ले हो यार सब आशिक मुस्तफा मेरे मौला हो सब आशिक मुस्तफा मेरे मौला हो सब आशिक मुस्तफा मेरे मौला محمد اللهم صلي على سيدنا محمد يا نوري محمد زيد بالوانس وديسوبيديات they committed crimes against your Ahlul Bayt surely they made a great mistake so here we are on Deen Al Haq and leading us is the noble one we send salams and salawat on your beloved Habibullah Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad Allahumma salli ala Truly Muhammad, you are the king of all kings. Labbaik Allah, humma labbaik, he lived his life for Allah's sake. So here we are, on Deen al and leading us is the noble one. We send salams and salawat on your beloved 
حبيب الله اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد ميري حسين تجي سلام ميري حسين تجي سلام ميري حسين تجي سلام ميري حسين تجي سلام السلام يا حسين السلام يا حسين السلام يا حسين السلام يا حسين جن قدوم كيسي كوفي بولايا غيا جن کو بیٹھے بٹھائے ستایا گیا جن کو دو کیسے کوفے بلایا گیا جن کو بیٹھے بٹھائے ستایا گیا جن کے بچوں کو بھوکا رولایا گیا جس کی گردن پہ خرجر چلایا گیا اس حسین ابن حیدر پہ لاکھوں سلام میرے حسین تجھے سلام میرے حسین تجھے سلام السلام یا السلام يا حسين السلام يا حسين جسن حق كربلا میں عدا کر دیا اپنے نانا کا وعدہ وفا کر دیا جس نے حق کربلا میں عطا کر دیا اپنے نانا کا وعدہ وفا کر دیا سب کچھ امت کی خاطر فدا کر دیا گھر کا گھر ہی سپرد خدا کر دیا اس حسین ابن حیدر پہ لاکھوں سلام میرے حسین تجھے سلام میرے حسین تجھے سلام We're having a short break from Mughrib in after half six we love to start the speech and then we take a break The Sheikh Trash will start up to the beach with here today May Allah give them a long healthy life and love and benefit from them by now for the speech Here she is done with the speech بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد فعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولنبلونكم بشيء من الخوف والجوع ونقص من الأمال والأنفس والثمرات وبشر الصابرين صدق الله معالي العظيم My dear respected and most honorable brothers, elders and sisters in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. First of all, uh, I'd like to thank uh, the organizers of this particular gathering for inviting me and enabling me to share with you some thoughts. Uh, secondly, I'd like to thank all of you uh, attendees who've taken out your valuable time to be here um, 
to learn and benefit from the lessons that we can learn from the sacrifice of Sayyidina Imam al Hussein at Karbala along with the Ahlul Bayt, the family of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We pray that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala accept our attendance today. Uh, we pray that Allah Azza wa Jal uh, will continue to facilitate such opportunities for yourselves together like this in the future, inshaAllah. Uh, without further ado, um, to get right into the reason why I'm here today and the topic that we're going to be discussing, it's extremely sensitive. It's so sensitive that not only did scholars in the past find it difficult to speak about this issue, they found it difficult to write about this issue. In, uh, Imam Jalaluddin uh, Al-Suyuti, rahimahullah ta'ala, in his book, Tariq Al-Khulafa, he writes, and, and the translation of it is this, that in the actual murder of Imam Hussein, in the qatl of Imam Hussein, is a long story that the heart simply cannot express, for indeed we belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and to him we shall return. And it was difficult for them to put pen to paper and actually discuss this story. And that's why you've seen, or you may have, or you may know of this, that many of the great scholars of the past, they refused to, to talk about the story of Imam Hussein. Not because they were trying to desensitize themselves or others around them, or they didn't feel like it was worthy of being discussed. Because they just couldn't bring themselves to discuss it. It's that difficult for them to to look through the events and and to then go through what happened with the family of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and not feel some guilt and shame um, and uh, feeling bad about the fact that the family of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had to go through this uh, traumatic experience. So naturally it's going to be difficult for, for me to, to speak about that issue but I'm going to split that talk up. Um, and in order for us to understand the events that took place on that day, in order for us to truly appreciate the magnitude of Imam Hussein's sacrifice, we need to know one thing. We need to know who Sayyidina Imam Hussein is. Uh, after we find out about Sayyidina Imam Hussein and his relationship with the Prophet Wasallam, his relationship with the companions, you need to understand, like our teacher would always tell us, understand the manat. The manat is the context. Uh, so the context here includes the people involved, the time, uh, uh, and the social context of the environment of that time. So the people involved, there are two main individuals that we're going to talk about, uh, two main characters. Uh, we have the individual who's on the haq, uh, who's correct, um, who the companions testify to his nobility, uh, to his God consciousness, to his levels of, of taqwa, and that being grandson of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Hussein And on the other hand, you have the same companions uh, and the same tabi'een who testify to the evil um, malpractice, to the uh, inherent injustice of the man that is Yazid uh, ibn Muawiyah. And inshallah we're going to, to discuss both of them before, I think we've got about five minutes so we get onto the, the actual uh, crux of the issue by talking about the grandson of the Prophet Wasallam. And this is something that will bring a smile to all of our faces because whenever we mention the name of Sayyidina Imam Hussein, Hussain, uh, it's, uh, it automatically, um, although you think about the sacrifice of Sayyidina Imam Hussein, but when you read through the books of Hadith, and Imam Hussein, bearing in mind, was only seven years old. According to some narrations, he was six when the Prophet ﷺ passed away. But in the books of Hadith and in the books of Tariq, uh, the books of Sirah, when you, when you see the interactions and you view the interactions between the Prophet ﷺ and Imam Hussein, they're so unbelievably uh, uh, emotional um, and loving. There's so much care and, uh, and affection there that it truly makes you uh, appreciate this noble grandson of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In the verse of the Qur'an regarding Ahlul Bayt, and one part of that verse is, إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ لِيُذْهِبَ أَنْكُمُ الرِّجْزَ أَهْلِ الْبَيْتِ وَيُطَهِرَكُمْ كَتِيرًا And in this verse, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is talking about the household of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. 
by saying to them, O oh people of the household of the Prophet, Allah seeks to remove from you your rids, your, impuri your impurity, and to purify you with extensive purification. After the revelation of this verse, people were unsure as to who he Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was referring to. Uh, who is the Ahl Bayt? Who are the Ahl Bayt? Sorry. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in one particular narration reported by Umm Salama, who is the wife of the Prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam. She said, Anna al-Nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam jaddala al hasan ibn Hussain wa Ali wa Fatimah al-Kisa'an. Thumma qal, Allahumma haula ahl bayti wa khasati adhib anhum al-Ritza wa ta'hirkum batira. Faqalat Umm Salamata, Ana ma'ahum ya Rasulullah. In this particular hadith, said Umm Salama, she reports that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he took hold, he put a garment, uh, a chadar as we would say, over uh, Ali, over Fatima, over Hassan and Hussein, and the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam then said, Oh Allah, these are members, they are the members of my family, wa khasati. And they're my close ones. So therefore purify them from impurity and uh, uh, with extensive purification. That, that's when Umm Salama, the wife of the Prophet وسلم, she said, Am I with them, O Messenger of Allah? And the Prophet وسلم, said, You're on the haq. You, you'll be okay, you'll be fine. Um, so therefore, according to this, this narration, the Ahlul Bayt, uh, primarily, when we talk about Ahl Bayt, it refers to the uh, Sina Ali, Sina Fatima, and then their children, yeah, Imam Al Hassan and Imam Hussein. There are some absolutely amazing ahadith of Sina Imam Hussein and his interactions with the Prophet. You might have heard of a few, and some of them you might not have. I've, I've collected a few here. There's one particular narration that um, it really uh, inspires me when. Uh, I remember listening to this narration many, many years ago, <coughs> and I was actually in the Masjid of Imam Hussein in the Ashar um, on the 10th of Muharram on Yumi Ashura, and the speaker at the time, uh, who was a former head of Al Ashar University, he mentioned this narration. It was the first time I'd ever heard it. And said so that Imam Hussein was uh, was very young; he was only a few a few years old. It's reported he was about uh, two years old, and the Prophet sallallahu he took hold of his of his hands. And then he, uh, he says to uh, Imam Hussein, he said, climb up. And Imam Hussein, he places his feet on the feet of the Prophet And he begins to climb up the body of the Prophet while the Prophet is holding on to his hands. Um, and he climbs up until the, the, the report mentions that his feet are on the chest of the Prophet when the Prophet is holding him out by, by his hands. And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the hadith he said, Allahumma ahibbahu fa inni ahibbu. Oh Allah, love him for indeed I love him. And this is, this is something that you'll find, this is something that you find consistently throughout the hadith that mentioned Imam al Hassan and Imam al Hussein. That the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam declaring his love for him. You'll, not, you'll, not, you'll rarely find that with, with any other companion or any other family member where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is informing the companions that I love him. Not only do I love him, he asks Allah to love him because he loves him. And then he asks the companions to love him because he loves him. Uh, and not only that, the Prophet ﷺ, he said, whoever loves Ali, Fatima, Hassan and Hussein will be with me on a platform on Yom al So that same Daraja with me. The Prophet ﷺ is promising that for those individuals who have love and admiration for Sayyidina Imam Hussein. And this again extended to the companions also. That love could be found in the life of uh, uh, and the Khilafah of Sayyidina Abu Bakr as siddiq and then Sayyidina Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu and then Sayyidina Uthman and Ali, may Allah be pleased with them all. There's a hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam which I just mentioned before you. The hadith is Man ahabbani wa ahabba hadhani wa abahuma wa ummahuma kana ma'i fi darajati yawm al qiyamah that whoever loves uh, these two, whoever loves me and he loves these two, referring to Hassan and Hussein, and their mother and their father, they will have a daraja with me, they will be with me on Yom Al-Qiyamah. There's that famous narration that you all have heard of, Al-Husaynu minni wa ana min al-Husayn. 
Hussein is from me and I am from Hussein. That's again showering his love and affection for Sayyidina Imam Hussein. Uh, that narration goes on. There's a second part to that narration mentioned in Imam Tirmidhi, where, where the Prophet وسلم, informs the companions that Allah loves those who love Hussein. Uh, this is who said that Imam Hussein was. The second hadith, one is that climb up hadith of the Prophet. And the second one uh, that I remember hearing from, from that particular uh, Shaykh. Uh, many many years ago and it was the first time again that I heard this narration I don't know whether you've heard it before it's reported by Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Abbas collected by Imam Tirmidhi uh, Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Abbas reports that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Hassan Hasan ibn Ali and Atiqihi he says that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he was carrying Sayyidina uh, Imam Al-Hassan uh, the elder brother, brother of, of Hussein upon his shoulders and a man witnessed this and he saw the Prophet وسلم, and on his shoulders was sitting uh, one of the princes of Jannah, said Imam al Hassan. And the Prophet, uh, that one of the companions, he saw this resplendent sight and he says, <laughs> SubhanAllah, he says, Ni'mal markabu rakibta ya gulam, that what a beautiful ride you are riding. So, what a beautiful mount you have. And the Prophet said, and what a beautiful rider he is. Um, in another narration, it's mentioned that this wasn't Hassan ibn Ali, it was Hussein ibn Ali who was sitting on the shoulders of the Prophet. You have heard of that narration where the Prophet went into sajda uh, while he was praying in jama'ah, in congregation. And he prolonged his sajda to such an extent that the companions began to think that something had happened. So they began to think to themselves, perhaps the Prophet ﷺ has passed away in such a why is, why is he prolonging it so long for, for such a duration? And then some of them began to think, well actually this is the perfect position in which the Prophet ﷺ would pass away in sajda to his Lord. So the companions who were in the front staff, they lifted their heads from the sajda to see what was the reason. And then they saw that Hussein was on the back of the Prophet ﷺ. He had just climbed on top of the Prophet ﷺ and he was just there. It's not as if he was sitting there. He was lying down on the back of the Prophet ﷺ, holding on to uh, the Prophet ﷺ. And then they said, SubhanAllah, they uttered utterances outside of the prayer to just, just to put the, the rest of their minds at ease that there's a reason as to why the Prophet ﷺ is prolonging his sajda. And then they went back into sajda. And the Prophet ﷺ, he never got up from the sajda until Hussein ibn Ali got off the back of the Prophet ﷺ himself. And then he stood up. In one of the narration it mentions that then the Prophet ﷺ stood up and he continued with the prayer. In another narration it mentions that the Prophet ﷺ, he stood up and he lifted Hussein ibn Ali. And he picked him up and then he continued with the prayer with Hussein ibn Ali in his arms. This is the level of affection and love that the Prophet ﷺ had for Sayyidina Imam al-Hassan and Imam al-Hussein. I think we mentioned the last hadith and then we leave. There's one hadith and I don't know whether you've come across this, this narration uh, before. <clears throat> the Prophet ﷺ was, uh, he was giving, he was delivering a khutbah. And whilst he's delivering the khutbah, uh, the doors of the masjid opened and Sayyida Shababi Ahl Jannah, the Prophet used to refer to them as the two leaders of the youth of Jannah, Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein. It's reported that they were about um, four and five years old, respectively. They, they, they enter the, the masjid and they walk directly towards the Prophet. You know, these are the two princes of Jannah, they're not going to sit at the back. You know, they're walking in. And as they're coming in, the hadith mentioned that they're wearing beautiful white um, uh, dresses that Sayyidina Fatima has, had washed and, 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 and placed on them. And as they, they, one of them trips over the leg of the other, and they were both about to fall. Um, and the Prophet وسلم, he left his foot, but immediately went down and grabbed hold of both of them. And then he picked them both up, and then he went back on the limb. And that's when he quoted the verse of the Quran that indeed your, 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 your wealth and your children are a, a trial, a tribulation for you. 
and then he mentioned to the companions that I, he explained his actions by saying that I looked at these two children walking and as they were about to fall down, I could not patiently bear that any one of them was to fall and, and be hurt. And this is the reason I went and left my khutbah to pick them up so that they wouldn't get hurt, so that they wouldn't fall down. This is reminiscent throughout the life of the Prophet ﷺ. And this is something that is, is consistent throughout the life of the Prophet ﷺ. He couldn't bear to see Hassan and Hussein hurting. In fact, there's a famous narration of, uh, uh, of the Prophet Wasallam when he once was walking past the house of Sayyidah Fatima and he, he heard Hussein ibn Ali crying inside. So he enters the house. And he asks Sayyidah Fatima, he, in fact, he goes up to Sayyidah Imam Hussain and he picks him up and Imam Hussain stops crying. And he says to Sayyidah Fatima, why did you not stop him from crying? Don't you know that it hurts me to hear Hussain cry? So this is the, the level of love and affection that the Prophet Sallallahu had for Sayyidah Imam Hussain. This is the reason why he referred to, uh, and the other companions, of Abdullah ibn Zubair also uh, states this, that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said, Huma reyha, uh, that in my sweet roses uh, in this dunya, in this life. This is who Sayyidina Imam Hussain was. I think we'll, um, we'll stop here. We'll continue with some of the ahadith in relation to who Sayyidina Imam Hussain was. We, we mentioned his connection with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and how, how much the Prophet and the companions loved him. But what about his taqwa? You know? It's not enough for you just to merely be a... I say merely, it's not enough for you to be a grandson of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and automatically, you know, there's no nepotism in Islam, right? Just because he's the grandson of the Prophet, because of that he's not entering into Jannah. He's going to enter into Jannah because of his actions and the individual that he was. So we're going to talk about his levels of taqwa and blood consciousness before we move on to the accursed Yazid, inshaAllah. Um, I think we'll leave it at that now. Um, the prayer rooms are on the left hand side as you walk out, so if brothers and sisters want to make way to the prayer room, you can pray over there. Before we left for the prayer, <coughs> we were talking about the life of Sayyidina Imam al Hussein. Um, the, we can only truly understand and appreciate the legacy of Imam al Hussein and his sacrifice at Islam and his sacrifice at Karbala by understanding the man who was Hussein himself. In order for us to understand who he was, we need to look at what the people said about him. Um, if I want to know what Sakib was like, and I don't know anything about him, I don't live in his vicinity, or even in his era probably, um, and I want to know what, what, what he's about, I want to know what kind of person he is, I'm going to ask those who are close to him, I'm going to find out from those who live in his locality, those upright citizens, um, who know him well and say, listen, what do you know about this man, his family, tell me about him. In exactly the same way, in order for us to understand and appreciate Sayyidina Imam Hussain, we can look at what the people said about him. Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Umar, regarding the sacrifice of Sayyidina Imam Hussain, and after he was martyred, and again, this is moving on from uh, uh, the, the love that the Prophet Sallallahu had for him, and that extended to his companions also. Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Umar, when Sayyidina Imam Hussain was martyred at Karbala, uh, he was performing Hajj. Uh, and in the Hajj, uh, there was a group who, which came from Iraq. And they inquired, uh, they wanted to know about the killing of a fly in the state of Ihram. And Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Umar, he, he, he began to cry. And he said, the people of Iraq, they, 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 they're asking about the killing of a fly in the state of Ihram when they murdered the son, the grandson of the Prophet sallallahu And he began to cry at him. The, the Tabi'een state that people couldn't stop him from crying. Uh, that was the sheer uh, emotional state that he was in. And people felt that after the martyrdom of Sayyidina Imam Hussein. And in fact, when we move on to the lessons that we can learn from, from the sacrifice of Imam Hussein at Karbala, we'll see that how it woke the people up. And they needed something like that uh, to wake them up and eventually led to the demise of, 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 of Yazid. And it led, in fact, to many, many more companions, appro approximately 10,000 companions who, who were killed um, thereafter. So uh, that's something that 
that we can we can learn from. Regarding Sidna Imam Hussein and his levels of, of taqwa and God consciousness, uh, there are reports, various reports from uh, the great companions of the Prophet وسلم, including the individuals who were in Yazid's army and who fought with Sidna Imam Hussein. They themselves state that Imam Hussein was on the haq. Why? Because he was a noble individual. He was a righteous individual. He was a man who prayed often at night. He followed the sunnah of his beloved grandfather. Uh, we all know that he looked like the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Zubair states that nobody resembled the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam more than Imam Hussein did. Um, but not only did he resemble the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam externally, internally too he was like the Prophet Alaihi Salatu Wasallam. So he was kind-hearted, he was, he was God-conscious. He, he ensured uh, that people were looked after. He would take care of the, the weak. He would, um, he would honor uh, the, the, his relatives. And he would honor the guests of the Prophet ﷺ. So there are many, many stories about his, uh, his outstanding levels of akhlaq and his morality. And I don't think we need to talk about them because, you know, the, the, the stance of the scholars of hadith is quite clear. That as sahaba kulluhum udum. That the sahaba, they are all just. And we have said that Imam Hussain is among the leading sahabis of the Prophet ﷺ. Like I said, in order for us to understand and appreciate an individual and who he was, we need to look at what the people said about him. You had Imam Hussein who was right. You had Imam Hussein who was just. You had Imam Hussein who was the most noblest <coughs> living being at that time. There was nobody. The likes of Abdullah, the, the, the Ibadillah. The Ibadillah referred to the three Abdullahs. Abdullah ibn Umar, the son of Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab. Right? Abdullah ibn, ibn Zubair. And who was Abdullah ibn Zubair? He was the son of Zubair ibn Awam, radiallahu ta'ala, and who was from the heavenly Ten, the Ashar Abu Bashar, and the uh, daughter of Sayyidina Abu Bakr, Sayyidina Asma. In fact, Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Zubair's story is amazing in, in and of itself. He was uh, uh, born to the Muhajirun. When the Muhajirun, they, they, they migrated to Medina, and they arrived in, in Medina. They had no, no male children were being born to them. Um, uh, and, and, and the women who were pregnant at the time gave birth to, um, to uh, women. Not that that's, a, that's a bad thing or anything. Um, but the, 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 the state that people lived in at the time was that they looked down upon the companions for that. And they, the Muhajirun became ridiculed because of that by the Quraysh in Mecca. The, the Kufar in Mecca they began to say, Allah and Uzza wal Manat have cursed them, and Allah and Al Uzza wal Manat were their gods. And the gods who give them, or according to them, gave them children. And they said, Look, they've cursed them. They've gone away from us. They've been cut off. They're Abdar. That's why the Prophet was referred to as Abdar by, by the Kufar in Makkah. That he's cut off. Inna a'tayna the one who curses you is the one who is cut off. The one who goes against you is the one who is truly cut off. That's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed in response uh, to the taunting of the Prophet So they began to say the same thing about the muhajirun. They're cut off. No, they're not going to have any. They're not going to continue. Their, their, their nasab their, is not going to continue. Their heritage is not going to continue. And the, all it took, what they didn't understand was all it took was the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam for him to raise his hands in du'a, and Allah subhanahu wa taala to answer his prayer. At that moment, um, Sayyidah Asma was 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 pregnant with, with a child, and uh, uh, that child was born, and that child, the first uh, of the male children that was born, that were born to the companions, the Muhajirun, was Abdullah ibn Zubair. And often, the scholars have stated that he was born of the du'a of the Prophet alaihi salatu wasallam, Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Zubair the grandson of Sayyidina uh, Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala so you had the son of Abu Bakr Abdullah ibn Umar you had the son, the grandson of Abu Bakr Abdullah ibn Zubair 
uh, and then you had Abdullah ibn Abbas who was from the family of the Prophet وسلم, the cousin of the Prophet وسلم. so they're all related these individuals and they are again in their own right there are many uh, merits of theirs that have been mentioned in the books of hadith but all three of them unanimously and unequivocally state that the most noble person during that time or after the time of the Prophet وسلم, and the, the Khulafa al Rashidin, Sayyidina Abu Bakr, Sina, Umar, Sina, Uthman, and Ali, after that time, the two most noblest individuals were Sayyida Shababi Ahl Jannah, the two leaders of the youth of Jannah, Imam al Hassan and Imam Hussein. And after Imam, uh, Imam al Hassan passed away, then it was Hussein who was the most noblest person of that time. And his nobility wasn't only because he was the grandson of the Prophet وسلم, or that he was beloved to the Prophet وسلم, is because he was the most God-conscious from among them all. He was pious. Right? He was caring. He was affectionate. He was like the Prophet uh, And that's what um, made him stand out. On the other hand, you know, one of our scholars will say that in order to, for you to understand something, you have to understand its opposite. In order for you to to interpret something, you have to understand what its opposite its opposite is. So if I, uh, you know, in order for us to know what hot is, we have to know what cold feels like, right? In order for us to know what good is, we have to we have we had to have experienced some sort of evil, and uh, in and in this story, the good versus evil, the good was Sayyidina Imam Hussein, and the 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 did. His, his opposite was, was Yazid ibn Muawiyah, and Amir, the son of Sayyidina Amir Muawiyah ta'ala. After the, 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 uh, the passing or the death of Sayyidina Amir Muawiyah, Sayyidina Amir Muawiyah was the sixth, sixth Khalifa of Islam. Uh, you had the four rightly guided Khalifas. After that, for about six months, you had the rule of Sayyidina Hassan ibn Ali radiallahu ta'ala. And, and he abdicated in favor of uh, Sayyidina Amir Muawiyah in order to bring about union between uh, two groups and in order for there not to be any bloodshed or bloodshed or civil war. And this is again of the dua of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam once the Prophet was sitting down uh, beside the member and Imam Al Hassan came and Imam Al Hassan was, was a young child at the time and he grabbed hold of Imam Al Hassan and he put him there next to him and he was continuing with the, with the khutbah and the, 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 the report that Hadith mentioned, he would look at the companions, then he would look at the, the, the Imam al Hassan, he would look back at the companions, he would look back at Imam al Hassan, and then he stopped himself in the middle of his, his khutbah and he said, Ibni hadha Sayyid. That this, this son of mine is a Sayyid, he's a leader. And then he said to them that perhaps Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring about a union or unity between two parties because of him. And that was when Sayyidina Imam al Hassan uh, uh, abdicated in favor of Sayyidina Amir Muawiyah. Sayyidina Amir Muawiyah radiallahu ta'ala an became the Khalifa of the time. Now, there was already internal dispute. Sayyidina Amir Muawiyah, um, during his reign, people, there were people who were dissatisfied, dissatisfied with his governors and the people that he had in place. But he himself, is a, is a Sahabi of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He's a scribe of the Wahi. Right? And our Aqeedah, and Imam Al-Tahawi states this, right? Uh, in Aqeedah uh, Al-Tahawiyah, that uh, our Aqeedah is that the, the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam are just, the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam are good. They're not ma'thum. They're not ma'thum. Ma'thum means they're sinless. They don't commit sin. They don't err, they don't, commit, they don't make mistakes. No. Ma'asumin are only the prophets, the anbiya. The companions, they did. They were companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We always talk about that, that funny sahabi of the Prophet Alaihi Salatu Wasallam, who was beloved to the Prophet Alaihi Salatu Wasallam. And he would drink alcohol, and he was lashed. He drank alcohol again, and he was lashed for drinking alcohol. So drinking alcohol is a crime. It's haram. So there, it's not as if the companions were sinless. It's that the companions, they understood, we understood, and we know from the statements of the Prophet ﷺ that they were the best of the Prophet ﷺ's nation. The best of people are those who do my time. 
then those that follow them, then those that follow them. That's why we refer to that generation uh, as, 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 as the accepted generation and we go back to them when it comes, when it comes to issues in relation to our fiqh. So Sidney Amir Muawiyah was a companion of the Prophet والسلام, the scribe of the revelation. There are many ahadith where the Prophet والسلام, spoke out in favor of Sidney Amir Muawiyah. But the same could not be said for Yazid, his son. Uh, in the books of history, in the annals of history, you can open up uh, any of the books of history, you will never find any legitimate historian, uh, any accepted narrator to mention even a single hadith or statement in favor of, of Yazid or uh, talking about the good character of Yazid or talking about the nobility of Yazid. Never. You just won't find it. Look for it yourselves. It won't happen. And that just goes to show you that not one individual had anything good to say about this man. That's who Yazid was. And again, we cannot blame Sayyidina Amir Muawiyah for the mistakes of Yazid. We can't do that. Because when we talk about the story of Karbala, it's easy for people to do that. We've got people, individuals, uh, in among our own communities now, who blame Sayyidina Amir Muawiyah and say the, the crimes of Yazid are his fault. And he's somehow to blame for it. The Sahabi of the Prophet ﷺ. But in the same way, why don't you then blame Sayyidina Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas? Sayyidina Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas is from the heavenly ten companions. He's from the Ashara Mubashara. And who was the son of Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas? Umar or Amr ibn Sa'd. So who, who was Ibn Sa'd? He was the leader or the general of one of the armies that besieged Imam Hussein and his family at Karbala. That's who Ibn Sa'd was. Are we going to blame the, the, the great father of, of that individual, the noble father, the noble companion for the mistakes and for the evil and the wrongdoing of his son? We're not going to do that in exactly the same way. We don't do the same for Sidna Amir Muawiyah. Yazid was his own man, he was responsible for himself. We're all responsible, responsible for our own actions. The vast majority of the Muslims, including all of the Sahaba who were present at that time during the reign or the start of the reign of Yazid, they were completely 100% against it. But unfortunately, they didn't have the strength to speak up because his reign was so cruel that he immediately began his reign by killing many of the companions of the Prophet It's reported that far from being an exemplary Muslim, which he was not, uh, he regularly missed his prayers. He never prayed. In fact, it's reported, I think there's one hadith or one statement I read somewhere where it mentions something about Yazid praying. But otherwise, every single statement that you read from the historians is that Yazid, he never prayed. He was both cruel, he lived a treacherous lifestyle, um, and you, you can, we'll mention some of the statements from the great historians of that time. Imam Jalaluddin Suyuti described his ca character in, in Darukhul Khulafa, this is what he said, he said Yazid indulged in sinful behavior, he married women along with their mothers, daughters and sisters, he drank alcohol and did not perform zina, he did, did not perform salah, uh, and continually uh, performed or engaged in zina, in, uh, in adultery, in fornication. Another witness described the faithless, faithless character of Yazid by saying this, we've come from a man, and this means that we're following a man, this man is our leader, who has no religion. He drinks wine, he plays uh, musical instruments, he passes his time with songstresses, uh, he plays with dogs and he makes dogs and bears fight with one another and spends his evening talking to robbers young men. This is the individual that we are now following. So they were, shame, they were saying that, these, or they were making these statements out of embarrassment and guilt themselves. That this is the man that we know, from the likes of Umar and Abu Bakr and Uthman and Ali and Hassan and Muawiyah we've gone to Yazid, this type of individual who, who never misses his prayers. It was always uh, uh, and this is, is prevalent in the lives of, of the Khulafa, that the Khulafa would lead the prayers in the masjid of the Prophet Not only did they pray, they were the Imams. Abu Bakr led 
that Imam during his time. So did Umar, so did Uthman, Ali, same with Imam Al Hassan and Sid Amir Muawiyah. As soon as Yazid became the Khalifa, he appointed somebody else as the Imam. He said, Listen, I'm not going to be there. And he appointed somebody else to, uh, to, to lead the Jama'ah. Ibn Asir, Ibn, not Ibn Kathir, Ibn Asir, he's a famous historian known as Ibn Asir al Jazal in his Tariq Kamil. He had this to say for Yazid. He said, Yazid was notorious and well known for his love of numerous musical instruments. He had a passion for hunting and he played with, with young men, dogs and monkeys, etc. Every morning he woke still drunk from the previous evening. His monkeys and young boys wore gold caps upon their heads. If a monkey died, listen to this one, this is, this is the reason why I mentioned this. If a monkey died, he spent a considerable amount of time mourning it. When a monkey of his would pass away, he would spend days in a drunken stupor crying for his monkey. And the reason why I mention this is when we come to the end and some, there are some individuals now who state that Yazid was forgiven or Yazid wasn't to blame for the killing of Imam Hussein. We're going to come to that when we talk about what happened or what took place after Karbubala. After the martyr of Hussein, the Imam Hussein, Abdullah ibn Zubair, and I told you who Abdullah ibn Zubair was, the grandson of Hussein Abu Bakr, radiallahu ta'ala, and uh, he, he uh, compared the character, the noble character of Imam Hussein and the indecent character of Yazid. And this is what he said, and this is mentioned in Tariq al-Tabari. Indeed, by Allah, they killed a man who stood in prayer, referring to Sayyidina Imam Hussein, at night for long hours, who fasted frequently during the day, who had more right to govern than they did, and one who was more entitled to it in terms of deen, in terms of religion, and outstanding merit. Indeed, by Allah, he would, he would never ever exchange the Qur'an for singing. And now he's referring to Yazid implicitly. Right? Because Yazid, he was spending his time at night listening to songs and people singing uh, instead of recitation of the Qur'an. He would never exchange the Qur'an for singing, nor would he exchange fasting for drinking forbidden drinks. Again, referring to Yazid drinking alcohol. Nor would he exchange gathering in religious groups to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for rushing off in pursuit of gain. And that was again referring to Yazid who was just uh, known to be a hunter. And then he reported, he, he mentioned, or he, he made the statement at the end, that they will meet their destruction. This is what Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Zubair radiallahu ta'ala and states. He had absolutely no care for any authority. He declared himself to be a king. He said, I am Malik al -Yazid. I am Malik. Malik means I'm a, I'm a king. I'm not a Khalifa, I'm a king. I rule over you, you're my subjects. You're my servants. That's, how, that's what he believed himself to be. He had absolutely no care for any of the scholars. He killed scholars indiscriminately. He didn't care about writing of books. In fact, so much did he ridicule the scholars of the time that uh, uh, Tariq al-Tabari mentions this, uh, Imam al mentioned this, Ibn Athir and Ibn Kathir in Bidaya wa Nihaya, that he would dress up his monkeys as the scholars. And he would dress his monkeys up in robes and place, uh, and take the turbans off the scholars' heads and place them on monkeys and then parade them around town and say, these are our scholars. These are just some examples I'm giving you to, in order for you to, to paint a, a mental image in your mind of the faithless character of, of this man and what type of individual he was. He was, like I said, he was the complete opposite to what Imam Hussein was. Imam Hussein was a pious, humble individual who loved to live a life of simplicity, whereas Yazid, he uh, lived a pompous life, an arrogant lifestyle um, with... Uh, with, with no piety uh, in, in sight. As soon as he became the, the Khalifa, he immediately went on a reign of terror and tried to get the, the allegiance of people around him. Um, and he understood that people accepted Imam Hussein. People knew Imam Hussein. Imam Hussein was a grandson of the Prophet People were going to flock towards him. When Imam Hussein spoke, people listened. Right? Where Imam Hussein walked, people followed. 
So they understood, he understood that also. So he immediately tasked his governors to get Imam Hussein to uh, swear a pledge of allegiance to him. And Imam Hussein, being the grandson of that prophet, who stood for social justice, who stood for everything that was good, who stood for piety and God consciousness, he couldn't lower himself to give his hand in allegiance to a man that he knew was not befitting of that leadership. He, he just couldn't do that. So Imam Hussein, he goes to Mecca. And the story of Karbala, I'm going to summarize itself, right? Because we've heard it on many occasions. Um, when he went to, to, to Mecca, he met with the, with the likes of Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Umar, uh, Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Zubair, who was in Mecca at the time, uh, who said to him, uh, you know, uh, stay here, stay with us, we will fight with you, we will protect you. At the time, he was re receiving letters from Kufa, and the Kufans, um, they reveled in their love for the Ahli, uh, the Ahli Bayt, right? At the time, so they began to send letters to Imam Hussein and said to Imam Hussein, come here, come to Kufa, and we've got thousands of people here. They're going to follow you, we're going to fight for you, we'll establish our state here, a, a just state, a pious state a state of Islam, a state revolving around our deen. And Imam Hussein uh, took his family with him and Imam Hussein left. As he left, he was informed by Abdullah ibn Zubair, who was uh, uh, an intelligent, extremely intelligent man, who said, look, the people of Kufa, you know, like we would say to someone, unka dine iman bin ali, you know, they don't have deen of iman, right, inside them. We don't mean that, it doesn't mean that they have no deen or iman inside them. It means that they're not to be trusted. And that's what Abdullah ibn Zubair said to him. He said, listen, these individuals are not to be trusted. Don't go. They will turn at any moment. I said that uh, Imam Hussein states that, you know, this is something that I have to do. And Imam Hussein goes, but on the advice, listening or taking the advice of, of the likes of Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Zubair and Abdullah ibn Abbas and Abdullah ibn Umar, he sends his cousin, uh, Muslim bin Qutil, uh, again from the family of the Prophet to Kufa to find out what the situation was at the time. So Muslim bin Aqil goes to Kufa and he, uh, you know, he receive a, receives a rapturous welcome. People welcome him with open arms. There are thousands of people. They immediately pledge their, their allegiance to Muslim bin Aqil and say, listen, tell the Imam to come here and we're going to support him. And Muslim bin Aqil then sends a letter uh, to Sayyidina Imam Hussain saying that these individuals, you know, the pledge, they, they pledge their allegiance and they're here and uh, they wish to fight with you. And Imam Hussain continued on his journey. Uh, during that time, Yazid found out about what's going on in Kufa. So he changed the governor and he, uh, the governor to uh, Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, the, the accursed ibn Ziyad. And ibn Ziyad went there with his army and. Uh, <coughs> They, um, by terror, they turned those people around. They basically said that whoever houses Muslim bin Akim and whoever pledges allegiance to Muslim bin Akim is going to be killed like a dog in the street. Um, and they immediately people read it from their agreement. And Muslim bin Akim, the house that he was living in at the time, or the individual that he was living in, both of them were executed. This is again the, the this is a relative of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Muslim bin Aqeel. Um, and that's when uh, Imam Hussein was approaching Karbala. And he heard of this, news of it reached him. That Muslim bin Aqeel has been martyred, he's been killed. While walking on this earth, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, A Sa'd is a Jannah, a Sa'd is a Jannah. That's who Sa'd ibn Abi Uqas was. And Ibn Sa'd, had, he had a legion, an army with him, it's reported that it was either 1,000 or 4,000. And uh, he was about to go to a different place with his army, with his, with his regiment, with his forces. And Ibn Ziyad stopped him and said, go to Karbala and bring me the head of Hussein. And Ibn Sa'ad, he had a conscience at the time. So he said, look, he's my family. Sa'ad Sa Ibn Yuqas was from uh, the Banu Hashim, from the family of the Prophet he said, look, he's my family. I can't do that. Task somebody else with this. Somebody who has no familiar links with him. With what face 
will I be able to show my family after killing the grandson of the Prophet So he says, let me go home. And Ibn Ziyad said, look, you're the man, you're going to do it. He said, let me go home and let me consult with my family. Let me consult with uh, my elders. And he goes home and he stays awake that night and everybody says the same thing to him. He said, are you mad? Are you going to fight the grandson of the Prophet you're going to fight with that man about whom the Prophet said, so he's the Sayyid of Jannah. He's one of the leaders of Jannah. Are you going to fight with that man who the Prophet said, he's my rose on this earth? Are you going to fight with that man when he climbed on the back of the Prophet the Prophet prolonged his sajda. Are you going to fight with that man? And it's reported that his own family members turned against him and says, we're going to have absolutely nothing to do with you if you fight with, with Hussein. And uh, he goes back to inform uh, Ibn Ziyad of his decision. Um, and Ibn Ziyad informs him that, listen, if you don't go, there's a particular land at the time that he, he was tasked with or that was going to be given to him, granted in government. So he... He's, he, he's, he was going to go there and govern that particular, it's called Ar-Rai, that land. And he said, I'm going to take that land away from you. I'm going to make sure that you have absolutely nothing to do with it. And then out of fear of losing his land, he decides, okay, I'm going to go and I'll, uh, stop Imam al Hussein in, in Karbala. Ibn Ziyad still wasn't convinced. Ibn Ziyad said, listen, he does, he, he's going for that land. He's not going to bring me the head of... of of Hussein, so he sends Shimr with him. And Shimr again was a son of one of the a Sahabi of the Prophet. And Shimr was known for his cruelty and his barbarity. Um, and he he went with him. And then that's when they stopped Imam Hussein at Karbala. Imam Hussein again did not make any demands. Imam Hussein said, Listen, he gave them a proposal. He said, Let me go back to Medina. Let me leave. If you're not going to let me go to Kufa, let me go back, let me and my family go back to Medina. And that was refused, that was turned down by Ibn Ziyad. Um, then he said, let me go forward and let me have a meeting face to face with Yazid. That was turned down also. And he was informed that either give your allegiance now or prepare for war. And what war was it? The war that, you know, uh, him and his 72. Uh, family members that he had with him uh, again the reason why they were only 72 he went back and he said to them those of you who wish to leave they, they want me they want my blood those of you who wish to leave leave now and some people left and others remained and that's when uh, Ibn Ziyad then said that listen we're going to declare war on you if you don't if you don't uh, uh, if you don't uh, pledge allegiance to Yazid and uh, Imam Hussein was unwilling to do that. When uh, he came back, uh, Ibn Ziyad said to, um, to, uh, to Ibn Sa'd and Shim that now start applying the pressure. And the pressure that they began to apply is, uh, Ibn, in fact, SubhanAllah, Ibn Kathir mentioned this in Al-Bidayah wa Nihayah, that uh, Ibn Sa'd was the one who fired the first arrow and the arrow landed on the tent of the Ahlul Bayt. It landed on the tent of Sayyidah Zainab radiallahu ta'ala anha. Sayyidah Zainab was the sister of Imam Hussein and the daughter of Sayyidah Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha, the granddaughter <coughs> of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Ibn Kathir mentions that his father, Sa'd ibn Abi Waqas, was the first person to fire an arrow towards the enemy in defense of Islam on the Battle of Badr, while his son, was the first individual to fire an arrow against the family of the Prophet It just shows you the stark contrast between father and son. Sa'd ibn Abi Waqas, he fires the first arrow in defense of Islam. Sa'd ibn Abi Waqas, who valiantly, he, he defends the Prophet وسلم, at Uhud. He's injured at Uhud. He sells, he, the injuries that he sustains at Uhud, you know, almost killed him. But yet he defended the Prophet ﷺ while his son is firing the first arrow. And in fact, he turned to Shimon and said, make sure you tell Ibn Ziyad that it was me that fired the first arrow towards 
Hussein. So these individuals, they were hell bent on either taking his his uh, his pledge of allegiance or killing him. And not only killing him, they were intent on killing his entire family, so that not in one individual lives to tell the tale. And inshallah, we're gonna we're gonna talk about that as well. How Shimr wanted to kill Ali. Who is Ali ibn Hussein? Zen Abidin, uh, the son of uh, Imam Hussein, how he wanted to kill him afterwards when he was bedridden. On the 7th of Muharram, uh, three days before the martyrdom of Muslim, Imam Hussein, the, the bank of the river Euphrates, where they would uh, receive sustenance and take water from there and be provided with water, that supply of water was cut off to the family of the Prophet sallallahu that they're not going to receive any water. And that's when you had the likes of Ali Akbar. Ali Akbar was reported that uh, he resembled uh, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam out of all of the great grandsons of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasallam. He was 18 years old at the time. His auntie was Sayyidah Zainab, and he says to Sayyidah Zainab, his sister was was Sakina, Sakina, the daughter of the uh, of, of Sayyidah Imam Hussein. And he says he sees Sakina. He looks at Sakina, and Sakina, the young daughter of Sayyidah Imam Hussein, her lips are dry and she's thirsty. She she needs water. And he says, I'm going to go and fetch that water. And he goes back and he promises. And there's a beautiful emotional meeting between his auntie, his auntie who was like his mother, Sayyidah Zainab radiallahu ta'ala anha. Um, she had that connection with, 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 uh, with Ali, Ali Akbar. And he left and he was killed. But, you know, the way in which they were killed and the way they were martyred is, is unbelievable. Again, nobody wanted to face them the family of the Prophet وسلم, on the battlefield one on one. You know, they would fire arrows at them from a distance and then converge upon them and send a hundred men to take them down. Um, and that began to happen one after the other. And it continued to, to happen until Imam Hussein was left with, with nobody except his small child, Ali Asghar is called. The younger Ali Akbar means the elder Ali and Ali Asghar means the younger Ali. And that younger Ali was only six months old and he was dying of thirst. And Imam Hussein went to, to, to the army and he says to them, hey, look, don't give us any water, that's fine. But this six-month-old child, what is this six-month-old child going to you? No. He's not involved in the dispute between you and I. No. Let him have some water. And everybody, that's when the, the faces, because they all wanted to. There, was, there were people who were in the army who wanted to help send Imam Hussein. So they, they were all looking, and that's when, uh, uh, you know, uh, Shimon, he and the, uh, the other leaders of the battle, all the army who were there with them, turned and told them that it's not going to happen. And they immediately lowered their heads in shame that Imam Hussein was there with a small child, and we're, we're going to allow this small child to die. And that's when Imam Hussein said, by Allah, the person who gives Imam uh, who gives this small child water today, by Allah, I will give him water from the hands of my grandfather on Yomul Qiyamah. I will give him water from the fountain on, of Gothar on Yomul Qiyamah. The promise of Hussein <coughs> is enough for us to know that he was able to promise that. <coughs> he's going to be in that position on Yomul Qiyamah. You know, he doesn't lie. He's going to be in that position where he's able to give out water from the fountain on, of, of Gothar uh, on behalf of the Prophet and that's when Shimon ordered one of his uh, his accursed um, uh, soldiers to fire an arrow and the arrow uh, you know, hit uh, the head of um, the others report the face of uh, the, the small child and killed him instantly and you know, Hussein went back with that child. This, this is the barbarity of these individuals. To think that this was only 59 to 60 years after the, uh, the passing of the Prophet uh, Then Imam Hussein himself, he leaves. And Imam Hussein, uh, he fell on the 10th of, of, of Muharram. Uh, Ibn Asir in Tariq Kamil, he says that uh, one of those individuals who fought with Imam Hussein in Karbala, this is, this is his, his own statement. That I've never seen a person bereaved of his sons. His sons had been killed. Menfolk and his companions more lion-hearted than him. I've never seen anyone who was more braver than uh, the grandson of the Prophet. So the foot soldiers were scattering to his right and left 
like goats when a wolf comes upon them. And that's how they were scattered in front of him. Uh, and eventually uh, he was martyred. And as he, he was suffering from his wounds, he had been wounded uh, with hundreds of blows. Um, he, he was cut. He had an arrow that went through his mouth. Um, when he was about to drink the water from the bank of the river the Euphrates, um, and yet he asks at the end that he, he, he be allowed to go into sajda and to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and pray salah. And it was that asr prayer that he began to pray. And when he went into sajda, shul, cut off the blessed head of the, of the grandson of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The, the martyrdom itself is is harrowing. It's an, it, when you read about it and when you hear about how Imam Hussein was killed, you know that you know that head that would rest in the lap of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is cut off so mercilessly. Um, that's harrowing in and of itself. But then the aftermath of the battle, the way the remainder of his family. The women, his sister, his wife, his daughter were treated by being shackled in chains um, with their headscarves, their hijabs taken off their heads and paraded through the streets. And paraded how? At, paraded behind the spears, soldiers with spears and upon those spears the heads of their men. Uh, the likes of Sayyidina Imam Hussein uh, and uh, Ali, As Ali, Ali Akbar and uh, the other sons of Aqeel radiallahu ta'ala and the cousin of Sayyidina Imam Hussein. That's the, and the sheer bravery of uh, the likes of Sayyidina Zainab and inshallah we'll talk about Sayyidina Zainab and, and uh, it's, it's absolutely amazing how they were able to show that kind of patience and perseverance. You know, uh, I remember I was reading through um, one quote, and it's mentioned that Charles Dickens, the famous novelist, Charles Dickens, he said that if Hussein, and he's talking about Hussein, and he, he read the story of Hussein, he said, if Hussein fought to quench his worldly desires, then I do not understand why his sisters, his wives, and children accompanied him. It stands to reason, therefore, that he sacrificed purely for Islam. And th these are statements of of of, uh, of, of non Muslims. Edward Gibbon, another famous historian, he states that in a, in, a, in a distant age and climate, the tragic scene of the death of Hussein will awaken the sympathy of the coldest reader. And that's, that's exactly what it does. That anybody who reads or hears about the story of Imam Hussein is harrowed by his experience. And you cannot get those images out of your mind uh, having heard them, having listened to them. Uh, and uh, it does make you that emotional reading of the story of Sayyidina Imam Hussein. How, again, the aftermath, when his head is placed upon a spear and paraded through the streets and is brought to the court of Ibn Ziyad. And Ibn Ziyad, he takes his, uh, his staff and he touches the lips of Imam Hussein, saying, are these the lips that refuse to pledge allegiance? And one of the companions, he couldn't bear this, he was an old man, it's reported that he was blind, right? Um, half blind, and he could barely see. Uh, and he looked and he saw this sight, and he saw that, um, you know, this is the way the grandson of the Prophet sallallahu was being treated. And he couldn't bear it, he couldn't hold it in. And he said, you cursed individual, by Allah, I've seen the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa kiss those lips that you're touching with your staff. And immediately there, at that moment, in that court, Ibn Ziyad ordered for that man to be executed. And that companion of the Prophet Sallallahu was executed. Just so that people weren't going to get riled up. Just so that people don't get too emotional on seeing the head of Imam Hussein. Um, when the women were paraded through the streets um, of the city in Damascus, there was one particular woman who heard and this is a story mentioned by Ibn Athir. There's one woman who heard of, um, of some prisoners of war 
being bought. And that's how Yazid referred to them. Ibn Kathir mentions this. Yazid referred to them as this, the prisoners of war. The women of the family of the Prophet وسلم, were referred to as prisoners of war. The shackles and in chains paraded through the streets. And she heard this woman. So she said to her, her servant, and he, she gave she gave her some food and said, They asked, someone has informed me that some prisoners of war have been brought to Damascus. She didn't know who the prisoners of war were. Go and give them some food and, 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 and some clothes. So this servant, this maid, goes to uh, the, the women and she comes across Sayyidah Zainab and she gives Sayyidah Zainab clothes and she gives Sayyidah Zainab the, the, uh, the food. And Sayyidah Zainab, she begins to, to cry and say that look, we've been traveling, we've been paraded through the streets, we're in shackles and chains. People are throwing things at her, people are abusing us. Who are you, this one individual who's trying to help us? What is your name? She says, look, I'm uh, the maid of this, this woman. And uh, this Habashi woman, she's, she ordered me to, to help. She says, can you bring your, your, uh, uh, this woman to me? I want to meet her. And this woman is brought forward uh, and she comes to meet Sayyidah Zainab. And Sayyidah Zainab asked her who she is. And she tells Sayyidah Zainab her name. And she then, Sayyidah Zainab then asks her, why did you come and help us? Everybody is abusing us, everybody is vilifying us. Why did you help us? She said, I, um, when I was young, very small, I worked in the household of the Prophet Sallallahu And uh, my mother was, uh, used to help and I also would help Sayyidah Fatima radiallahu ta'ala and her with her chores. Uh, and once when we left when we left from there and came to Damascus, and this is before the passing of Sayyidah Fatima, she said that Sayyidah Fatima radiallahu ta'ala and her, she took me close and Sayyidah Fatima said to me that Whenever you see prisoners of war, take some food for them and give them some clothing. He says, so now whenever I hear that prisoners of war are being brought, I take some food and I give some clothes to them. Siddha Zainab, she doesn't know that she's talking to Siddha Zainab. Siddha Zainab is, is, is there crying. And Siddha Zainab said, is there anything that I can do for you? Is there anything? I've got nothing to give you. Is there anything that I can do for you? She said, I, I made a dua once, ask Allah for the acceptance of this dua that I made when I was very young and in the household of Sayyidah Fatima. I used to play with, uh, with Hassan and Hussein. And Hassan and Hussein were very young at the time. And I always had this desire to meet Hassan and Hussein and their sister Zainab. And that's when Sayyidah Zainab began to, to cry and she said that, that head on that spear is Hussein and I am Zain. Um, that's when this woman, on seeing this sight, that this is the granddaughter of the Prophet ﷺ. What is going on? What has happened during my lifetime? That you know these princesses of Jannah and princes of Jannah are being paraded and are being killed and treated this way in such barbarity, with such barbarity. She immediately joins them and she says to the people, shackle me also, I'm with the family of the Prophet When they're brought in the court of Ibn Ziyad, um, she raises her voice, this woman, and she says, how dare you treat Zainab, the grand, you know who Zainab is? She's the granddaughter of the Prophet How dare you treat the, and desecrate the bodies of the grandsons of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, how dare you? And Ibn Ziyad said, "Who is this insolent woman?" And she's, he's informed that it's this Habashi woman um, from Damascus who has joined them. He said, "Kill her immediately." It's reported that there were five thousand uh, Habashi fighters, uh, soldiers who served in Damascus in Ibn Ziyad's army at the time, and they were stationed there. Immediately they leapt to that woman's defense. And they said, how dare you? This is our mother. We're not going to let, nobody is going to harm a hair on her head. Anybody touches her, we will strike you down. And that's when Sayyidah Zainab 
in the court of Ibn Ziyad, she began to cry and she looked around and said that a Habashi woman has thousands of men to, to, uh, to protect her honor. And the granddaughter of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has none. Um, this was, these were the sentiments at the time. And there was intense embarrassment and guilt that the people felt uh, for not being able to, to help uh, Sayyidina Imam Hussein. And in the aftermath, for not helping uh, or doing enough for the family of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this is, you know, we, this is why we, we look at the, the, the different methods of commemoration today. And we see the, the, the Sunni Shia split. And we see how Shias commemorate the, the tragedy by trying to or attempting to relive the pain and trying to experience the agony. As if it's possible to experience that same sort of agony that they went through, or the tragedy that they went through. As for, for Sunnis, we commemorate the, the battle by drawing on what we can learn from it, the lessons that we can learn from it, so as to embark on, on a path of unity between Muslims and, and not to push people away. Um, we try to learn from the sacrifice of Sayyidina Imam Hussein, we commemorate and we shed tears. We cry for Hussein, we cry for his family. Uh, that's because naturally anyone would. Um, but the, 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 the way that the, we have the Ahl al today with this self-flagellation and, um, and harming oneself, it directly goes against the principles of the Qur'an and the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. وَلَا تُلْقُوا بِأَيْدِيكُمْ إِلَا التَّحْلُكَ The Qur'an says, Don't let your hands lead you to your own destruction. I.e. don't harm yourselves with your own hands. So that self-flagellation has absolutely nothing to do with, with our religion. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, look how much he suffered here throughout his lifetime. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I was talking in, our, in my Friday khutbah today, we were talking about mental health and depression and anxiety. And we talked about sadness and differentiating sadness from depression. So that everybody goes through sadness, periods of sadness. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there's an entire year in the history, in the biography of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, called Amul Huzn or Amul Hazm, the year of sorrow. In that year what happened, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's uh, pillar and his rock, his support, Sayyidina Khadija, his wife passes away. His pillar, his rock, his support in Abu Talib, his uncle passes away. Him and his family are, 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 uh, are taken out of, of, of Mecca and thrown into the valley of Abu Talib where they, they survive on leaves and some dates and hope that other people are going to bring them food. They've survived in that, city, in, in that, in that place for, for three years. Uh, during that year, the Prophet وسلم, goes out to a town and he, uh, he propagates to propagate the faith and he is stoned. Um, and Ibn Ishaq, one of the historians, or one of the biographers, he reports that the blood from the forehead of the Prophet وسلم, was flowing into his sandals. That's how much he was injured. So the Prophet وسلم, experienced hazm, experienced sadness uh, as well. But we cannot. Well, the Prophet وسلم, he never resorted to, to harming himself or harming those around him. وَاسْتَعِينُوا بِالصَّبْرِ وَالصَّلَاةِ Seek help through patience and prayer. وَإِنَّهَا لَكَبِيرَةٌ إِلَّا لِلْخَاشِئِينَ And that's something which is major, that's big. The Qur'an is telling us that's something big. إِلَّا لِلْخَاشِئِينَ Except for those who, who have khushuq, who have uh, uh, God consciousness in their heart. The Prophet Sallallahu's own daughters, all of his daughters passed away during his lifetime. All of his children passed away during his lifetime. His three sons passed away in infancy. Did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam flagellate himself? Did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam harm himself? Now he's going to be Zaid. Sayyidah Zainab was martyred. Sayyidah Zainab, Zainab bint Muhammad, the daughter of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when she migrated to, to Medina, uh, she was struck uh, and she was pregnant at the time, the daughter, uh, the, the, the wife of, of Sayyidina Amr ibn Aas. And she's struck uh, and she falls off the camel and she has a miscarriage. Every single historian reports that Zainab passed away a short while later when she reached Medina. Um, and she died of her injuries after having been struck. This is the daughter of the Prophet wasallam during the lifetime of the Prophet wasallam. So it's not as if the Prophet wasallam didn't experience any sadness in his life. So they, he taught us how to be patient. In exactly the same way, his 
grandson on the plains of Karb. Karbala. Karbala has come from the two words Karb, Wabala, you know, grief and misfortune. That's the place, the name of the place is grief and misfortune. He taught us how to show uh, patience and how to patiently persevere. Uh, inshallah, I'm, very quickly, I'm just going to go through some of the lessons, and I think we've got about five minutes and then we'll end it there. We can talk every year when it comes time or the tent of Muharram comes along. We can talk about these stories and we can cry, we can shed a tear or two. But if we learn nothing from his sacrifice, then our tears are pointless. They don't mean anything. Right? Our wailing or whatever we do, anything, our salawat that we send upon the Prophet and his family in our prayers every single day it's worthless, it's pointless if we don't take lessons from Sayyidina Imam Hussein's sacrifice the very first thing that we need to understand is the difference between Hussein and Yazid was Hussein was a man of prayer Yazid was a man who didn't pray Hussein started now, in, in, during his infancy, he would climb upon the back of the Prophet while he was in prayer. He was taught how to pray. He died with his head in the sajda. That distinguished him from, from Yazid. You and I, who like to sit on our pedestals and talk about whether it's permissible to curse Yazid or not, right? And that's the only discussion realistically that takes place. Not whether Yazid was forgiven. No other Yazid was a good individual. The only discussion that takes place in the books of history and the books of Tariq is, are you allowed to curse him or not? That's it. With some scholars saying, no, you shouldn't. And others saying, yes, you can. Ibn Kathir is one of them. That's the only discussion that takes place. Are you allowed to curse this man? So while you're sitting there having your discussion on whether to curse Yazid or the permissibility of cursing Yazid, question yourselves and ask yourself, are you more like Yazid or are you more like Hussein? Because Yazid never prayed. Hussein has built his whole life around the worship of Allah. Around the worship of Allah. Uh, another thing that we can learn from, from, from his life is that we as Muslims, we should never rely on, on quantity. We always rely on quality. Uh, and the reason why I say that is it was. Uh, logically, it seems ridiculous to assume that um, 72 people will come face to face with 22 or 25,000 and win. But that's exactly what they did. See? That's exactly what they did. Because when we talk about who won and who lost, uh, history speaks for itself. Uh, Imam Hussein, uh, you know, just, let, just, let's just look at how history treats Hussein and how history treats Yazid. Karbala stands for the sacrifice, the courage, um, the bravery of Imam Hussein. When we mention Karbala, automatically that's what we think of. Mahatma Gandhi himself states, I learned from Hussein how to be wronged and still be a winner. That's what Imam Hussein was. He won on that day despite the fact that he was martyred. And that's why the Prophet would tell us that when a Muslim fights in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he wins either way, either he comes back a Ghazi by winning the battle or he wins by attaining martyrdom and Imam Hussein was that example. Um, Thomas Carlyle, another historian that you, you might have heard of, he said the best lesson which we get from the tragedy of Karbala is that Hussein and his companions were the rigid believers of God. They illustrated that numerical superiority does not count when it comes to... That's what Thomas Carlyle said. Uh, Soren, uh, Kierkegaard, who is a, 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 a Norwegian historian, uh, he said that the tyrant dies and his rule ends, the martyr dies and his rule begins. And that's how we remember Sayyidina Imam Hussein. The tyrant died and his rule ended. Who knows of Yazid? Put your hands up, anybody here who has heard or knows of a man named Yazid. Is there anything wrong first? First of all, is there anything wrong with the name Yazid? There's nothing wrong with the name. It's just who it's associated with or who it's affiliated with now. There were, it was a popular name among the Arabs, Yazid. Imam Bukhari, 
سبحان الله امام بخاري ان تاريخ كبير he lists the biogra- biographical details of 213 individuals named Yazid 213 he never mentions Yazid ibn Muawiyah this implicitly shows himself he's trying to show that that man isn't even worthy of being mentioned among the names we don't even count Yazid ibn Muawiyah so it was a popular name yet you don't know anybody called Yazid why because people don't want to associate with his name they don't want to have anything to do with that characterless faithless individual put your hand up if you know uh, someone in your family you share the name or you know someone in your family or you know a friend called hussein everybody everybody It's the third most popular name in 2006. It was the third most popular name in the UK. Subhanallah. Why? After Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam the name Hussein is the most popular name. Why? It's not Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali and they were great in their own right. It's because of the significance of the name Hussein. People wanting to remember and keep the memory of Hussein alive. That's why we say history will judge who is uh, the winner and who is the loser. Ibn Hajj al-Asqalani in Tahdib al-Tahdib, uh, it's a book of, uh, of, of biographical narrators recording the narrators who have narrated a hadith from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said that he has no prophetic reporters that are dependable. In fact, uh, he only mentioned Yazid. He said Yazid has absolutely no Um, uh, prophetic reporters that are dependable who speak about his life he only mentioned Yazid once in the whole biography and this is a biography of of people and he, you know Yazid was a person Yazid was a, was a figure he was an authoritative figure he was a man who was well known in his time albeit for the wrong reasons but he was influenced but yet Ibn Hajj al-Asqalani rahimahullah ta'ala He only mentions the name Yazid once, referring to Yazid ibn Muawiyah. And the only reason why he mentions him is to dis, di, uh, distinguish him or differentiate him from another Yazid called Yazid al Nakhai. He said, no, this Yazid, he's been talking about one individual and people say, oh, well, that's Yazid. He goes, no, this is, this is not Yazid ibn Muawiyah, this is Yazid al Nakhai. That's the only reason why he mentions his name. This is what Hussein taught us. Hussein taught us sacrifice. Hussein taught us. Uh, how to fight against sectarianism. You know those individuals today and those scholars today and scholars would be, that's me being kind. Today who state that the battle of Hussein was a political battle. It had to do with politics. And they say Yazid Rahimahullah Ta'ala or Radiallahu An. It's absolutely ridiculous. What political battle are you talking about? Where are you taking this from? They're the same individuals and the same scholars who state that no, even if a tyrant rules over you, you patiently persevere. You don't speak out. You don't start a rebellion. You don't do anything against the tyrant. Let him rule. It's amazing how those same individuals live under oppressive regimes, live under muluk kings, They're the same individuals talking against Hussein. You see, there's a, there's a reason why they're politicizing that. Because when they talk about Hussein and what Hussein stood for, automatically they're teaching the people that we need to rebel against the, the sectarian authority that we have who, uh, uh, who are ruling over us. And we need to not accept its legitimacy. I don't accept the legitimacy of For example, uh, the the uh, the Hijaz. I don't accept the legitimacy of Saudi Arabia. To me, that's a Hijaz. The kings of Saudi or the kings of any country. This is what Hussein taught us. Hussein taught us that leaders are supposed to be the best of you. Your leaders are supposed to be those who you look up to. Your leaders are supposed to be the light. You know, Hussein lived under Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, and Hassan. And Muawiyah, he saw leaders. He saw people 
who lived up to the teachings of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But uh, despite the fact that Yazid was, you know, he had lingual and uh, regional unity with Yazid, they spoke the same language, they came from the same tribe. Yet the Prophet, the Sayyid Imam Hussein, he was unwavering in his desire to not give his hand in allegiance to such an individual. The role of women in uh, in, in the story of Sayyidah Zainab, you know. Uh, the strength of Sayyidah Zainab radiallahu ta'ala in her, her continued fight and she kept the memory of Hussein alive wherever they went when their family went back to Medina she would always talk about Hussein and what happened in Karbala so people know that this is what happened to the grandson of the Prophet in fact the khutbah that she gave in the court of Yazid um, according to many of the historians is one of the most impassioned khutbahs ever given and it was given by Sayyidah Zainab radiallahu ta'ala and her. She never backed down, never feared, never feared. She was the, the, the daughter of, of Ali and Fatima. She was the sister of Hussein. She wasn't going to back down. Um, to those who, who say that Yazid was, was forgiven or Yazid had nothing to do with it, you only need to look at what happened after Karbala to, to understand what kind of individual this man was. He attacked the cities, the, the sanctuaries. He attacked Medina. He attacked Makkah. Historians report this. There, there are authentic ahadith, sahih hadith, where Sayyid ibn Musayyib, who was one of the, uh, the great scholars among the tabi'een, the ones who followed the companions of the Prophet wasallam, he states that when Yazid attacked Medina, for three days nobody was allowed to read namaz in Masjid al-Nabawi. In Masjid al-Nabawi, Yazid's army tied their horses and their camels. In... in, in to desecrate the masjid of the Prophet Sayyid al Musayyib, he said, I was a young child at the time and I hid in the hujra of the Prophet and it was locked from outside. I didn't know what time of day it was. I did not, I had no idea. I couldn't, there was no light that I could see. The only time I knew it was time to pray is when I heard Adhan coming from the grave of the Prophet this is what Sayyid ibn Musayyib reports. This is an authentic narration of the Prophet When I used to hear the Adhan coming from the, uh, from the grave of the Prophet, Prophet that's when I would pray my salah. I would know that it's time to pray. He attacked the, the, the Kaaba with fireballs from outside when people were gathered in the Haram. The horns from uh, the, the, the skeleton, the head of the skeleton of the animal, that ram that was sacrificed in place of Ismail by Ibrahim salam, the horn of that ram or the horns and the skeletal remains of that ram were present on top of the Kaaba. Throughout the life of the Prophet wasallam, throughout the life, lives of, of the Khulafa al-Rashidin, up until the time of Yazid, <coughs> they were destroyed when half of the Kaaba was destroyed when Yazid attacked it. So to say that the man was forgiven or he showed remorse or anything like that is, ludic is a ludicrous statement. You only need to look at his actions thereafter to understand what kind of individual he was. And his actions uh, speak louder than their assumptions of him. The last thing that I want to mention before we finish, uh, we've gone on long enough, is, is sacrifice. Uh, Sayyidina Imam Hussein paid the ultimate sacrifice. He sacrificed his life for something that he stood for. He sacrificed the lives of his family for, for, for something that he stood for. What he believed to be right, he believed to be just. And he stood for it and he sacrificed, he made the ultimate sacrifice for it. I want to ask first myself and then pose this question to you. How much do we sacrifice for the sake of our religion? How much do we sacrifice for our love? We don't need to make that major sacrifice, the ultimate sacrifice, like, like Hussein did. We don't need to sacrifice our lives for the cause. We can't even sacrifice our time. How often do we sacrifice a little moment of our time to send salutations upon the Prophet? How often do we sacrifice our time to ensure that we pray our prayers? How often do we sacrifice a little bit of our time at night to open up the Quran and read it? How often do we reach into our pockets and sacrifice a little bit of our wealth to give it away in, away in charity. So look at the ultimate sacrifice of Sayyidina Imam Hussein and then think about the sacrifices that you have to make daily. 
Are you doing justice to that sacrifice? You can cry for Hussein, but if you don't live by Hussein and live according to the example of Hussein, then your tears are worthless. My tears are worthless if I do that. And that's something that we need to learn from. So these are just some of the lessons uh, that we can learn from uh, with the story of Sayyid Imam Hussein Mabir Allah Ta'ala. Jazakallah again for all, all of you attending. Um, I pray that uh, first and foremost I be benefited myself in the talk and you uh, receive some benefit uh, from it. Uh, we end by sending salutations of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Mawlana Muhammad wa ala Ali Sayyidina Mawlana Muhammad wa ala Ali Sayyidina Mawlana wa ala Ali Sayyidina Mustafa Jani Rahimat Pela Kusalam Mustafa Jani Rahimat Pela Kusalam Shamari Bazme Hidayat Pela Kusalam Suhani Ghari Jamga Tai Baka Chaj Suhani Ghari Jamga Tai Baka Chaj Us Dil Afroz Saat Pe Lakho Salam Mustafa Jane Rahmat Pe Lakho